chat. Um, I'm going to bring you in. I'm just a boy. Maybe some of Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. In the name of Allah, the merciful benefactor, the merciful redeemer. Um, I first want to start off um, to make sure I clarify about um, the acquisition of the uh, store next door. I'll close that door, please. Um, just because the uh, there were treasurer was a little concerned, so I want to make sure this is clear. I mentioned this in the clipbot on Friday that we have the um, the funds to purchase the building. Alhamdulillah, we purchased enough, I mean, we uh, collected enough from this community, this community which I say is not a wealthy community at all, to um, purchase the building. So um, Alhamdulillah for that, but we still are collecting monies. So I want to make sure the community is clear that we're still collecting monies so we can um, pay the bills for this building and pay the bills for the next building. Uh, so it would obviously largely deplete our um, bank account by purchasing that building. And like, it has to be done. And people who are on the email will understand that um, it has to be done. So uh, we're doing the purchase of the building ASAP, probably the next couple of days when I talk to our email, the email about it. Because uh, we have a deadline that we want to get to, and it's uh, before the end of this week. So inshallah, we'll get that done. Uh, so any believers that, is, that will watch this video or, or that are watching now, still send your monies in to um, cash out dollar sign M-W-S-A-L-A-A-M. We can mail it in still or mail it into the P.O. box. We're still collecting funds because we'll always be collecting funds to make sure that we are maintaining the buildings. Um, I want to make sure that it says so that is clear and that we still are collecting monies for uh, maintaining the business at this point or maintaining the both buildings at this point. Uh, the other thing is that the last three chutbahs that I gave um, unfortunately were stopped in the middle and that was because apparently the um, speaker that we have, so actually the internet service that we have, the um, live recording pulls the most from any than any other thing, right? So I'm asking them, why is it not stopping while we're doing Sunday to Aileen? Uh, but it stops on Friday, you know, and then, you know, this conspiracy mind starts coming in like, well, what is, on Friday, they want to stop this, you know, as you know, it's most people here then. But um, what happens is this, one of the reasons is because there's more people here. And if they have the, um, the password to the Wi-Fi, then it'll pull from that, it'll draw from it, and that's what's stopping it. So it's not, um, it's not um, Cox Cable. It's the uh, service that we have, and what is happening is my phone is connected to it. The laptop that I'm using, that I'm using, reading off the flip bars, pulling from it. That laptop is pulling from it, and the speaker that we have. So, inshallah, Friday's moving forward. I'll just stop on my phone and stop on the speaker from pulling from that bandwidth, so we'll be able to record record it fully. Uh, so what I've been doing in the meantime is recording the clip um, bars again later on uh, in the afternoon or the next day so people are still able to get the, the message. Uh, it's not the same because uh, Friday's clip bar, I was feeling it. I was really feeling it because the believers were, so I wanted to, I wanted to read, I want to actually watch it again myself because I generally don't watch any of my clip bars or anything that I do over again. 
just because I see all the flaws in it. I know what I should have been saying. Y'all don't know, but I know exactly what I should have said when I didn't say it, so I don't watch them. Um, but inshallah, moving forward, they, move, moving forward this Friday, it'll be uh, it'll be better, and it will go all the way through. The other thing I want to mention is that we probably will have uh, some food moving forward. We had a brother who came a couple of weeks ago, uh, and he said that he would uh, he owns the Crown Chicken Restaurant, and uh, that he would be donating. He called on Friday, but this Friday I, I was not able to uh, get with him. Uh, he said if we can come pick it up, then we'll be able to get it each Friday because he's already doing it for, I think, the one of the matches in um, Newport News and maybe one other place. So he called me again, so I'll make sure moving forward we set up a plan so we can uh, have that, inshallah. So today I wanted to talk about uh, Al-Qur'an, some of the uh, short surahs in the Qur'an. By the way, let me start off with this. As soon as I, I had something in mind, then I saw somebody who I had not seen before, so I wanted to speak to you, ask you, how are you doing today, sir? What's your name? Eid. Eid. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. Um, do you have any questions or anything that you wanted to, to, to know about? I'm very familiar with this. Yeah. Okay. I'm just excited. I, I'm just getting back and getting the rust off my own bones. I ain't been <laughs> to Juma in a while. Alhamdulillah. So this is uh, Ta'aleem, the Juma is on Friday, right? Yeah. So um, yeah. inshallah, we see you on uh, Friday coming up. Well, our our um, Juma is at the time of uh, Lua prayer. Yeah. So it'll be about this same time, about one set, 107, 108 on uh, Friday, inshallah. Yeah. So we'll be here at that time. Yeah. To be specific, it's all Juma. To me, because it's a lifestyle for me. Right. Even Ta'aleem and everything. Absolutely. Like, it's just like all you can do, but I got the samples. Alhamdulillah. That's the uh, beauty of those people who are interested in learning, interested in knowledge. That was the other thing I wanted to talk about. I just I just remember, because also in the khutbah, I was mentioning to something that I only mentioned to really one person, so they um, may not be aware of it. My wife asked me, she said, you know, do you know if the believers understood what I was saying on uh, Friday? And the khutbah is that, um, inshallah, in October, the end of October, which is next month, I'll be in uh, Mali in Timbuktu. Uh, and I want to explain how this happens also to the community so they're aware. So this all started from Imam Ali Salam. And Allah is definitely the best of plans. Um, his, Imam Ali Salam was reached out to by someone who was a friend of his son who is uh, the manager or the librarian at um, Blyden Library on Tidewater Drive in Princess Anne. They are having a centennial celebration, 100 year celebration, because this black uh, library has been open for 100 years. So they asked him to uh, participate in the celebration. And he said, well, he's right here in Norfolk. Maybe you should ask me. So uh, he said, um, he called me and said, uh, I gave them your number. Um, they should call you. I'm like, alhamdulillah, I definitely want to help in a centennial anniversary. Uh, and Blighton, Edward Blighton is the uh, the father of Pan-Africanism. You know, he wrote the book, uh, Christianity, Islam, and the Negro People. And it's a very, very uh, powerful book, especially because he's a Christian and he's writing in favor of Al-Islam. I personally am not sure the man died as a Christian. I think he was he died as a Muslim because he said so much favorable things about Islam. He talked about how Western Africa was transformed from Al Islam and not from Christianity. You know, he said Christianity was a hindrance while Al Islam in West Africa brought advancement. He said every place that Muslims were dominant or they were the leaders of was advanced in science, technology, everything. Right? And uh, he said Christianity had the avert, uh, reverse effect on, on the African and African-American people. So it's, it's really interesting. But anyway, and, and, and I also intend, however, to get some copies of that book, especially when this uh, celebration is going on. So the celebration is set for next year. And I'm, I'm involved in the planning of it because I'm going to do something. <laughs> I'm not sure exactly what I'm going to be instrumental in. Um, that reminds me also, next week, September 10th, I'll be at Norfolk. State University with the Virginia Symphony, or Symphony Orchestra um, with a couple of other um, people from other faiths, uh, a rabbi and a, 
a minister, uh, a Christian minister, and we're going to be just doing something that pertains to uh, inclusion. We could just do it like a small speech, and then they'll do you know do their thing. But anyway, so I want to be included in this uh, 100-year anniversary. And it'll be May is they're going to do a um, garden party. So they're going to be out there on the field and they're going to have dignitaries. They're going to try to have Tim Kaine, uh, Bobby Scott, uh, a bunch of other people there. Right. And they're going to do that first. And then on June, they're going to have a block party. So they're going to be celebrating, you know, both of those instances, they're going to be celebrating this 100 year anniversary. So I'm talking to him about this and he says, maybe you can help me with something else. He said, I just went to Mali, and uh, the imam of St. Kuru University, which is also a masjid, if you've ever seen the picture of this um, basically made from dirt and mud university that has like spikes hanging out of it, they just had an um, a anniversary where what they do is like repatch it to make sure it stays up. He said, the imam from there, he's trying to get him to come here, right, to celebrate um, uh, some some what he's trying to do there. So what, this is what he said is um, he's going to be coming here and he wanted him to find a masjid that he would be able to pray in and you know be comfortable in. I said, Alhamdulillah, we definitely would have a place for an imam from Mali to come here, right? He said, I said, well, I know people who know Arabic as well. Maybe they can translate some of the, what he was doing is Blyden Library is also going to digitize uh, some ancient manuscripts from Western Africa. Right, some of these manuscripts are over a thousand years old. He says some of them are uh, are at the start of the fall of Ro the Roman Empire up to about 150 years ago. So from 150 years ago all the way to probably a thousand years ago, what happened is when the European came and was colonizing Africa and kidnapping us and bringing us here, they started hiding all of their history because the Europeans would burn them and destroy them. So they have an estimated 700,000 manuscripts. And what, is, what I also learned just recently is they were um, hidden and given to families. So these families kept them like family heirlooms. And they kept them, they're very, um, they are very sincere in guarding them. So when I go there, I'm going to be basically talking to a family, and they're going to be providing me with these things. But different families had different manuscripts. Um, so I learned that from uh, Zakia, actually. Cause, so she was, uh, I was, she was mad at me, by the way. You know this? I'm gonna tell you about this. I'm gonna tell y'all a little bit about this. So, because uh, I, I gotta, I gotta fix this. I gotta fix this in some way. So, uh, uh, we're gonna digitize some of those manuscripts and bring them back here. And um, I said I would definitely want to be a part of it. Next time you go, you let me know. The man told me at the beginning of August. I'm going in October. I'm like, okay. <laughs> I didn't know you made this soon, right? Because what he wants to do is. He's going to have the centennial celebration, then he's going to have another celebration for these manuscripts. He's going to have this at Slover Library and make a huge deal out of that and try to have dignitaries, all kinds of people there again for this. And this is a young brother, by the way. He's probably in his maybe early 30s, but he's like really doing things. When he says he's going to do something, something is being done. Like I said, he told me about this two months later, we going to Mali, right? And um, the interesting thing about this is when I was a kid, I didn't think Timbuktu was a real place. It was a joke. You know, I'm going to beat you and beat you all the way to Timbuktu, right? Even when I went and got my um, my passport information, um, I said, I'm going to Timbuktu. And the lady, like, kind of snickered. She got to laugh a little bit. And I, I didn't take offense to it because I know just recently, I knew, I just found out that Timbuktu was somewhere real. And, it's so, and how instrumental it is to our history and how instrumental it is to our learning. That, uh, that this university and, and masjid that I'm going to is one of the first universities ever built in the history of universities. It is also the second still standing university ever. I mean, ever, ever, right? So my whole plan when he said it was going was to go there and um, stand beside that masjid that Mansa Musa made, because that's my whole plan. I'm like, I want to go step with Mansa Musa. I was going to be like this. Take a picture of me beside it, right? So the first, the next person I thought of, I talked to, I talked to uh, Nabi about it, and then I talked to. She said, "You need to talk to Zakia." I talked to her. She fussed me out. She was like, "Why didn't you think of me first? I got rebuilding Timbuktu. I was gonna put your books on there. I put your books on there, and you ain't even think about me." I said, "I'm so sorry." Uh, but listen, I felt she made me feel like dirt. I'm like, man, I'm sorry, right? So once I got over that, I got over my apologies. 
she told me about about these manuscripts that I'm going to see. And she said you can buy something to do the scanning yourself. Because I, I had no I had no idea about that. I'm thinking about he's gonna do this digitizing and I'm just gonna be there to facilitate it. Um and then she says you can do it. You know, you gotta have your certain gloves and all these things you need to research doing that. She told me it's gonna be families that's gonna be having these manuscripts. So then I was like, I can bring these manuscripts from Master J. Williams Salam. Because I was thinking about we're gonna go over there to the library and see them, right? And say, yeah, we was a part of this, but we can I can digitize it myself and go there. So alhamdulillah, if we if I can get that under wraps, it'll be another thing that uh, I'll be able to do there. there. We're also trying to foster some relationships because there's gold and cobalt, all kinds of things in Mali. But like I told you, my only plan was to go there and, and walk where he walked and pray in that masjid where at one point five, uh, what is it, 500,000 people were studying it. I just want to be in, the, in that place, right? Uh, and then now, now I'm realizing there's other benefits to it. So I'm trying to think of research what I can do when I get there to maximize my time. There, I'll be there uh, two two weeks, but one of the one of the days will be in travel uh, back and forth. So basically, about 12 to 10 days I'll actually be there. So, uh, alhamdulillah for that, and it's a, a great opportunity I could not pass up. So I want to explain that because I talked about it briefly in the khutbah, but. I don't know if anybody knew the backstory, probably except you. I think you was the only person I told, and I told you that because I was afraid that I wasn't going to make it. You know, like, uh, what happened is I had to take a yellow fever shot, then I had to go to drive to D.C., and I told them why I'm going, and they said, well, prove to me that somebody invited you <laughs> from uh, Timbuktu to go here, right? I guess, maybe, you know, anybody say anything, they're also having, you know, they just kick friends out of there, so they're having issues with that. Also reached out to somebody who's in Mali. And I, I may be able to get some transcripts from Sudan and Nigeria that he already has. It's Imam there already that I, that I know just from social media. But um, they said, prove to me this. You have to give me a letter in French, <laughs> in French, <laughs> all right? And it has to be certified. So I was like, okay. Uh, I talked to the, the brother that uh, is the, that's the manager of this library, and they we got it in a couple days. Um, I don't know what the letter says. I just know my name is on there in capital letters. I can read my name. I don't know what French says, right? It must have, it must have said, you, I'm allowed to go here, right? So I sent it to them, and I finally got it the other day. And when I got it the other day, it was like right before um, right before Juma, maybe the day before. So I was like, okay, I'll let, I'll let people know now because it's, it's official. I bought the ticket because I didn't want to buy a ticket until I was assured that I could go. And um, I found out. UNESCO. I know, you ever seen UNESCO, right? So I've seen it in reading. So U N E S C O is a um, organization that um, protects historical landmarks and historical um, places. So UNESCO stamped my my letter. I'm like, yeah, I'm somebody for real now, right? Uh, official, you know, I'm official now, all right. So I got this. I got it digitized. I'm probably gonna print it out so I can just put it somewhere and say. Not only did the man from San Curry University, but UNESCO, all these folks. So this is a protected place that I'm going to, and I'm invited officially. So um, alhamdulillah for all of those things. It just and it pan, it all happened from Imam Ali Salam saying he over here in Norfolk. Why you talk to him? <laughs> right? He don't even know when he get, he sees this. Cause I was I, once I got all this uh, proved, I was gonna call him and tell him and, get, and thank him for all of this because he just doing it out of the kindness of his heart and like. It makes sense to ask somebody in Norfolk to be a part of this Norfolk uh, celebration, and that turned all the way into me going to Mali next month, <laughs> right? So, alhamdulillah, that's that's how a lot plans. A lot is definitely the best of planners. Uh, I had no vision of this maybe three months ago before I talked to uh, before I talked to Imam Ali Salam about it. I had no plans on. I mean, I knew I wanted to go to some place in Africa, but I had no idea where I was going to go, and I definitely wasn't considering going to Timbuktu. I just wasn't thinking about it. You know, I read about it. You know, we had those books out there. I might have to get some more of those Mansa Musa books so people that know where I'm going and, and what, you know, what the significance of this is. Because Mansa Musa is, I said, I thought it was his brother, um, Abu, um, uh, Mansa Abu Bakr, but uh, Zakia said it was his uncle. He abdicated his throne and gave it to, um, to uh, Mansa Musa and traveled to the Americas. Before Columbus did, so you know these, this what I am hopefully embarking on is what our Western African Islamic history and scholarship that has not been tapped into. 
right? I also don't. I also know this that our our scholarship is not um, received and appreciated like it should be. But it's beginning to like with social media, with the changes that are happening in Africa right now. Africa is in the forefront of the news. They are saying we're going to be have self determination. All of those things will help elevate and bring some some light to Islam there and to Western Africa period and then that scholarship there because I would say that if there was an Arab who was the richest person who ever lived and he was a Muslim and he gave away so much money he destroyed the uh, Egyptian economy we would know more about it but because it's from West Africa we just find out about it if you understand what I'm saying uh, if you had scholarship 700,000 manuscripts of scholarships, we would know about it by now, right? If it was in Arabia or if it was in Egypt or somewhere like that. So we have to um, bring value and understand what we possess here. And if whatever I get, whatever it is, it's our real history, right? Not what somebody uh, remembered or what your ancestors brought down to you, but this is something that they wrote down specifically wrote down in Arabic and a couple of other, other different languages that I don't know, I can't think of offhand, of our history, who actually lived it, right? So this is, alhamdulillah, it's going to be very, very important that I do this. So let me get off of that one, because uh, you know, I get on a tangent thinking about that, just that, just what transpired and how all of this transpired. Even me standing right here, man, man, this stuff really is, I'm telling you all, the plan of Allah, the will of Allah. I had no intention of being a man ever, I mean ever. I had no plan of talking to people ever. The, re the first time I was talking to someone was from my brother's wife's um, history class, her religious class, not history class, her religion class. She um, said, can I come to the class and talk to them about being a Muslim? So I, what I did, what I done was I did write books on purpose. Now, that, I can't say I didn't do that on purpose, but that even came from the plan of Allah. That came from me wanting to talk to people about this being. And then they wouldn't talk to me, so I said, well, I'm going to go online and talk to them, force them to talk to me, right? They can't, get, they can't have me there, right? So I did that, and then in seeing what I wrote, I was like, you know what, this could be a book. And it turned into several books and booklets. And then, because I wrote books on it, um, my brother's wife told uh, her class about me. So I went to this um, uh, university that's in Newport News, a uh, small university, and I talked to the uh, religion class. And the teacher's name was um, Bruce McDonald. He's a Christian. And he goes back and forth from here to, um, I think, in Asia. And they do, like, uh, missionary work there. So uh, he thought I did such a good job, he asked me to come back each quarter. So I'm talking to different classes each quarter. And the more I get into it, he said, you should, you know, you should do this more often. I'm like, this is a Christian telling me I should do this more often, right? <laughs> right? So I'm like, okay. And then, you know, it just... All of these things just kind of evolved, and I had no, I, I had no idea that I was going to be in this masjid. I told Imam Farid about the same thing. Like my my father started in uh, Imam W D Muhammad's association, then he left, right? And then I had a friend of mine. So I, I when I was growing up and learning about Islam, I didn't really have a place, a masjid that was my home. So um, a friend of mine said, "Let's go to these different masjids and find out which place we want to be." I'm like, cool, we'll go to different places. I went to one place, I ain't going to mention, but they were terrible. And I'm like, I ain't coming back here, right? <laughs> so then I went to this place, and uh, I had some books that when he was given the football, he said, we're going to have a um, bazaar, and you can come and sell books or sell whatever. I'm like, cool, I got some books to sell. I did that, and they embraced me with open arms. I, I haven't left since. And then, so I'm, I'm in Yama, the Young Adult Muslim Association, and... Um, this is, you know, this is this what I'm saying is like the plan of Allah. It's like, so I'm a young Muslim adult association. Then the members of it start moving away to different places. I didn't move anywhere. I stayed here, right? So they said, well, this is what we're going to do. We're going to give you a responsibility. You're the treasurer now. All right? So I can't leave. I got to come here every Friday and Sunday, right? Make sure I count the money, right? So I still have a responsibility, something I have to do. And then that ultimately turned into the position that I'm in. And while before I was, I was before I was a man. But yeah, I was because uh, Imam uh, Hamid Allah was Imam. I was a treasurer, and I got that Quran that um, that um, Sister Swia had from Imam Farid. When he returned to Allah, he had a Quran in his office that um, she just randomly gave to me because she was giving away things. And I'm in my office looking at this book, 
And by habit now, if it's an old book, I look into it, just look at the first page. Because my dad, in all of his books, he wrote his name, and <laughs> he wrote something in there to like, let you know this is my property, because he loved books. In fact, he worked at the Bladen Library, and I guess nothing can happen to him now since he's returned to Allah. He <laughs> would take books out of the library. <laughs> he said he was liberating them. He was freeing them from the library because nobody else is going to get them. So he would, so I, that would also, also have me looking in to see which library he got this from, right? Uh, so um, I looked in there and it said um, the property of Calvin L. Owens. And I'm like, this looks like my dad's handwriting, right? I still got this going on, by the way. And, uh, but I'm like, this looks like my dad's handwriting, and his brother's name is Calvin. That's why my, my brother's name is Calvin, uh, his son's name is Calvin. You know, we got a bunch of Calvins after my uncle. So, and my uncle returned to Allah long before my, my dad did. So I'm like, I wonder if, if, this is my, my, um, if this is my uncle. But I didn't remember what his middle name was. So I called my brother, who remembers everything about everything. I said, Calvin, what's our uncle's middle name? He said, Lawrence. I said, man, you will not believe this. <laughs> Out of all the people in the world she could have given Quran to, or kept it herself, she gave it to me. It was basically a family heirloom that my, my dad had given to my uncle, then he returned to Allah, they gave it back to him, and he gave it to an Islamic community, it landed here. Then I became the treasurer, and she, when we had a bond, and she gave me the Quran. Otherwise, I would have never gotten it, right? That's why I mean, like, all these things just are not coincidences, you know. So, alhamdulillah. So, what I want to talk about today was a couple of uh, short surahs. I know I was talking far longer than I wanted to. The first one I want to talk about was um, Ashams, Surah um, uh, 91. Khalil, what does Ashams mean? <laughs> it means the sun. All right, go ahead and have a seat, man. It means the sun, right? So this is a Surah. Uh, call the sun, and this is this is how it uh, is recited. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajeem. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa shamsi wa duhaha wa khamari idha talaha wa nahari idha jallaha wa layli idha yakshaha wa samai wa ma bannaha wa al-ardi wa ma tohaha wa nafsi wa ma sawaha falaha maha fujuraha wa taqwaha. قد أفلها من زكها وقد كاد من دسها كثاب تمود بتقوها إذا باءت أشكها فقال لهم رسول الله نقة الله وسكها فكاتبوه فآخروها فدمدم عليهم ربوهم بتنبيهم في سواها فلا يقفوا أقبها. So it is translated. By the sun and its brightness, by the moon when it follows her. It says it in this translation. And I gotta make sure I say that just in case my Arabic teacher comes in here. I'm gonna say it for the rest of them, but that that part is important, right? But all of we must realize that in Arabic, there's no it, there is no neutral. It's either male or female. So everything is given a um, given an assignment of male or female. So the sun is female and the moon is the the word for it is male so um it's saying by the sun and its brightness and the moon when he follows her right um uh, some people i guess maybe because of their misogyny translate it differently so she says she says every time she opens the quran she goes to this surah and see what it says there if it says it she not kind of lets it be but sometimes they change the pronoun it says, and she follows him, right? For no reason at all. I mean, it's a moon and a sun. Why are you, why are you concerned with changing the pronouns, right? And why does that, why is that something that affects you in such a way that you want to change it, the translation of it? And that's one of the reasons why she uh, encourages us to learn Arabic, so we can read it for ourselves. So it goes on to say, and the day when it displays itself, and by the night when it covers and by the sky who he constructed and the earth and he spread it out wide and your soul and he proportioned it. The word for this is uh, sawaha comes from the word suya. I mean the same root as suya, right? Suya means perfected it or 
mashed or fashioned it or molded it just the way it's supposed to be. So our souls are proportioned the way it's supposed to be perfectly by Allah Ta'ala. Now the significance of that, especially for Muslims, when we talk to, to non-Muslims, is that we are created sinless. We have a perfect soul. We're not, we don't have the original sin or original stain on us. Allah created us perfectly, perfectly proportioned. And then he says about the soul and inspired it, meaning the soul. And the soul is feminine. Now um, in um, Surah 4, Ayah 1, Allah talks about the one soul and how he made from that one soul two beings. Soul is feminine. So I, when, I re, when I translate it, I say, and her, and she, right? Just to see if anybody catches on to this. Uh, Brother uh, Mahdi said, I heard you at the beginning of the, uh, the khutbah say, say her or she. Why you do that? So I explained it to him that the, the soul is feminine, but the body is masculine. And Allah create things in pairs. So the soul and the body together makes the human being. But the soul, everybody's soul, not just, not just women's soul, everybody's soul, the, it's... it's um, transcribed as feminine your body is masculine and they join together to make you. So it says and it inspired it, but it should say it inspired her, meaning the soul. The reason also now to be to be frank with you that when it's translated people say it in English is for um, for clarity, because otherwise I have to keep stopping and telling you when I say he or she I don't mean a man or a woman, I mean that that uh, entity is, is uh, transcribed or prescribed the position is male or female. So that's why they use it. They're not doing anything nefarious, but it will be so many notations because it's saying over and over again, and I'm not saying that's man or woman, just saying male and female uh, is, is what it's assigned. So Allah inspired the soul with discernment from wickedness and righteousness. And this is the part that's very important. He has succeeded who purifies the soul and he has failed who corrupts the soul. So the soul that we have, the Allah gives us, is perfect. We can corrupt it or we can purify it. So when we do something that is unrighteous, we do something that is wicked. First, Allah says he created it perfectly. Then he's inspired it to discern what's right and wrong. So we know what's, what's righteous, what's not righteous. So when we do something that is wicked, we are corrupting this soul, this root, this um, soul that Allah has given us. Because this is directly from Allah. This is our. This is how we live. The word root also means breath. That breath that you have when you're a baby, that's how you are alive. That's the difference between animate ob objects and inanimate objects. When you have that life, that breath of life that Allah gives you, it is perfect. And then you corrupt it by your wickedness or by your righteousness. And you have successful, Allah says, if you keep it pure. Or if you purify it, that's the, good, that's the point about it, is you can corrupt it. But also, Allah also gives you the ability to purify it. That's, why our, that's what our righteous deeds do. It's clean off that corruption that we have. It says he who has, has failed is the one who corrupts it. Then Allah talks about that mood. Now the mood uh, is a certain people. Actually an Arab people. When we think about Arabs, all we think about is um, Ishmael and Ishmaelites. As I said, uh, I told you all previously that um, the Midianites is mentioned in the um, excuse me mentioned in the Bible and mentioned in the Quran. They um, also were in, in Arabia, so the Ishmaelites weren't the only um, descendants of Arabia. So there's a lady named Keturah in the Bible that is said to be the third wife of Abraham. Now scholars say that she was probably Hagar. It wasn't a third wife, it was a second wife with a different name. They say it's probably Hagar, but they can't say for sure. So Keturah was uh, the lady from her and Abraham came to Midianites, and they also went to Arabia, right? So um, before that mood was, um, and these are tribes, by the way. So when you read this in the Quran, um, let me just take this out because I don't want to confuse you. The mood is not a person, it is a people or a tribe. So it's the tribe or the people of uh, the mood and the people of Ad. And they were um, before um, the Arabs. Right? Or they're, they're actually the 
the ancestors of the Arab people. They're they mixed together. They're the ancestors of them. So Allah is talking about in the Quran, that mood denied their prophet by reasons of their transgression when the most wretched of them was sent forth. And the messenger of Allah, the messenger that came to the people of Thamud was Sully. And we'll hear a lot about him, probably because, um, or Sully, because he is a prophet of Allah, is probably because he's not mentioned in the Bible, or there's no parallel between him and the Bible. It's, a, it's another man in the Bible named Sully, but they don't correlate those two. They spell it with the E instead of an I, if you may see that. But this prophet came to the people of Thamud and told them the same thing Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told them. They were worshipping idols. He said, stop worshipping idols and worship the one God. Allah is, is God. He is uh, the one that will benefit you and harm you. And the, the gods that you have can't benefit you or harm you in any way. So they asked for a sign. Show me something to prove to me that you're a messenger. Now, uh, in, the, in previous Talims, I was talking about this as well, that for Jesus, they wanted a sign, they wanted a, a miracle from Jesus, right? In the time of our prophet, they wanted something to show that he was a prophet, and he gave them this Quran. During the time of the people of Thamud and Sully, they asked for a sign, and the sign that he gave them was a she-camel. So this, um, he said, you see this mountain right here, from this mountain will come a camel. So they were, they were praying, or they were meditating somewhere, and then the camel came from out of this rock into a flesh and bone camel. And they're like, this is the miracle. So th this is the thing, too, with uh, miracles that people ask for. When you read the Quran and somebody asks Allah or asks the messenger for something to prove that they are a messenger, Allah is very strict in the punishment after that. What we call the disciples. Uh, in the Quran, they're called um, nasa, nasa, uh, the helpers, right? Meaning, like helpers of Allah in their cause or in His cause. They asked for a sign. They said, "Bring down a table with all this food on it, right?" So Allah gave them this miracle. He said, "I'm gonna give you this miracle. First of all, you got Jesus right here, and He's performing miracles already. Now you're asking for another one. If you get this miracle and you do not believe, I'm gonna destroy you, right?" Because now you're asking something specifically, and I'm going to give it to you. The same thing is true with the Quran. You're asking for something specific, I'm going to give it to you. But if you don't believe after this, you're going to have a problem. So Allah said, I'm going to show you, I'm going to give you this she-camel, right? Y'all ask for this. I'm going to give it to you. And you know what happened after that is they didn't believe. Just like the, the uh, children of Israel started worshiping a golden calf after Allah showed them all these miracles, these nine plagues, and freed them from bondage and slavery. They're in the wilderness, and they built a golden calf and prayed to that. People, for whatever reason, are so rebellious. They are so interested in making something that they can see and touch and feel and say that is God, right? After Allah manifests himself. So they have this she-camel, and the she-camel is drinking from the well. It's drinking water. It said the well that we have here, the camel's going to be able to drink from it, and you all will be able to get water from it as well. And uh, but they feel like, well, I don't want the she camel to get our get our water. Well, I don't want to share the water with it. So they say the most wretched of them. And this is what Allah is talking about here. Now this is this surah, ayah 90, 91 is one of the Meccan surahs, one of the early surahs, right? So this is the beginning of our prophet's uh, mission to tell people that he's a prophet. So this is why this story is mentioned. Um, so he's telling them this in parallel to his own life. He's saying, listen, this people have been before you. Your ancestors believed in multiple gods already. And they asked for a sign. And they asked for a sign from the prophet. And the prophet said, I'm going to give you this sign, but if you don't believe after that, you're going to be destroyed. So he's telling the, the Arabs the same, the same thing. Like, this happened before, what y'all are doing, right? So, so you should be paying attention to this. That's why all the surahs are short, because they're really like attention grabbers. They're made, made to say, listen to what I got to say here. Because this really pertains to you, and this is about your God, your God, and about your own soul and your own righteousness. So they have the cow, and then the most right wretched of them, his name was um, Qadir, I believe so, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Devised a plan to string up the cow and kill him, kill the cow, right? That Allah had given them as a sign, 
right? So Allah caused the earthquake to happen and destroyed all of them, right? Except for Sully and the people who believed. They asked for the sign, they received it, and then killed the sign that they had, <laughs> right? So this is why this is in here, because Allah must read it to you again. It says, Tamud denied their prophet by reasons of transgression. When the most wretched of them came forth, and the messenger of Allah said to them, Do not harm the she camel of Allah or her drink. But they denied him and hamstrung her, and their Lord brought down upon them destruction for their sins and made it equal upon them. And then the last of it says, And he does not fear, he does not fear the consequences of any of any of you. In other words, Allah does what he pleases and he don't care what, what you feel about it. <laughs> right? So this that's what this short surah is about. It's a it's a call to people. So Allah is swearing by the sun and its brightness and the moon as it follows the sun and the day and the night. Allah is swearing by these things, drawing attention to the heavenly bodies. Because Allah, if you notice, in a, many of the uh, Quran, or many of the uh, uh, surahs of the Quran, it starts off with, um, and with the praise of the sun and the moon over and over again, Allah is trying to draw your attention to the heavenly body. He said the heaven and the, the sun, the heaven and the earth and everything in them all are praising Allah. Right? Allah is telling you over and over again, everything is praising Allah except you. What's your problem? Really is what he's saying. Like if the sun, the, the, the moon, the trees, the grass, the ants, the plants, everything is in submission to Allah and praising Allah, what is your problem? So this is what that's why Allah swears by these things, drawing their attention to his creation. And from your creation, you understand the creator. And then he talks about your soul. Now, the soul that a human being has is something that had the human being has known since the beginning of time. They've always, throughout history, understood that they had a soul. Us in our uh, academic um, mind have to be convinced of a soul when it was basically an axiomatic truth by everybody in history they always buried their dead and the reason they had a burial and a funeral is because they believed in a soul and they believed in the hereafter it was a given to them if you just think about it yourself if all of us we got on a desert island and we didn't know anything about islam we just thought about ourselves uh, these people who are remote we never we didn't even read any books all right we, there was no books this was uh, let's say 7,000 years ago, because they also talk about the first human beings, that they were had the same capacity that we did, the differences in the technology. So they had the bra same brain capacity. So uh, Adam, alayhi salam, was just like us. He thought just like us. If he had this Quran here, he would read it just like we did. He would be able to use a, the internet, use whatever we did. He just didn't have that at his disposal. But those people thought about they were on a, let's say they were, these people were on a, a desert island. And some of us started getting older, some of us started getting sick, I started getting gray in my beard. I'm like, oh, something going on here. I'm not like, I'm not the same way I was when I was 12, or when I was 15, or when I was 30, right? And you see people start dying. The, in, the Your first instinct is, before this, when, if you just thought about it yourself, is, where did I come from? Who made me, <laughs> right? Why am I here, right? That's that's the basic question that should come to the mind of all human beings. Unfortunately, so many human beings today don't even think about it. They don't give it a second thought until they're about to die. And because Allah is so merciful, he still gives you opportunity when you're about to die. He said, because as long as you accept this deen before you die, you're fine. Even if you get sick. I know people right now who thought they were going to die from COVID. They, they thought literally thought they were going to die. I said, I'm going to change my life now because I thought I was going to die. Right, but Allah still, he says there are people at their deathbed that, that say, I, I believe in you now. And Allah accepts that, right? Of those people that try to, that are sincere in their attempts to change to change themselves over. But you don't know what if something happens, a building drop on you, and you don't get a chance to say, I'm changing. Right? <laughs> right? You know what I mean? So you should change now, and that's the reason why there is a benefit to changing immediately. Because Allah says the reward, then you get a better reward. That's why you have degrees and levels in paradise. The person who, who um, was a Muslim only in name and didn't really pray, didn't really fast, they may make it into paradise, but they shouldn't make it into paradise with the foremost. That's why Allah has the foremost and those people who are just regular Muslims. You know, they say they're Muslims, they believe, they kind of believe, you know what I mean? But you don't really know, right? So Allah makes degrees for that. He also makes degrees for hell. 
And somebody, some people who do some bad things, who, who steal and cheat and kill, and there's some people who kill 100 million people. You know, they shouldn't go to the same hellfire, and they don't. They go to one lower, and they get more punishment. Now, the, the good thing about that, if you think about it, though, is it's a, a possibility. A lot leaves the possibility that you may make it out of hellfire, though. Because if there's degrees, if there's degrees of heaven and there's degrees of hell, then maybe, because Allah is so merciful, this is, what, this is the beauty of this thing. Because when you think about all the things that Allah is merciful for and everything that you do and say, you get a blessing for. We're just talking about this. Allah blesses your good deeds tenfold, a hundredfold, seven hundredfold, right? So you do one good thing, Allah counts that as seven hundred things, depending on what it is. But he only counts your sin as one. So if you go to hellfire, you earned it. You, you, you really did earn this. And Allah says he'll forgive any sin, all sin, if you say, I'm sorry, God, I won't do this again. And sincerely mean it. Right? And try to make amends for it. Everything you do, you'll be forgiven for. So if that's the case, and you can do that, and then you have, um, and you still can be in your grave and still be collecting righteous deeds, still be collecting sadaka, then there's a possibility that maybe you can make it out of, out of hellfire. Also, they say the Muslim, the person who believes La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, won't remain in heaven, remain in hell. Even if the Muslim goes to hell, he won't stay there. Which means you get out at some point, right? So also, if you're at a certain level, maybe if Allah, if you're in there praying hard enough or do whatever, you might get to this level here where it's a little bit less burning, you know? <laughs> but the same thing may be true with the highest level, right? So if you're in there and you're praying to Allah, you have forever, literally, I'm going to tell you something that's, that's interesting about myself is that when I was a kid, I was really afraid of the idea of living forever. I mean, in paradise. I, it, the concept was so enormous that it scared me. I don't, I don't know why. I mean, it doesn't to this to, to today, but when I was a kid, I was thinking about, okay, if you do good, <clears throat> you go to heaven, right? But you're going to be there forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And because that was such a huge time, it scared me, you know. <clears throat> I guess the more, you know, the more life you live, the more you uh, think about things, the more they come into grasp and you're able to understand them. Because Allah also says in the Quran about heaven and hell is that Allah says those people in heaven, in paradise, now I'm going to make, sure, I'm gonna make sure I make the distinction between those two. So when, it, when Allah says, Samawati uh, wal Aradi, it says heavens or the earth. Right, heavens is the uh, the sky, the, the universe. It's not paradise. So we get those things mixed up because we speak in English terms and we say heaven, meaning paradise. But that could be getting gotten confused. So Allah mentions the heavens as well, and when He's talking about the heaven like above us, the 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 uh, sky and the clouds. But when He says heavens, He's talking about the universe. Right. So when we say heaven, we in English we think about paradise, but it's really Jannah, paradise is what we're talking about. So sometimes I may say it by mistake just from regular speech, but Allah doesn't call it heaven that we're going to go to when we leave. He talks about paradise. So um, the paradise that we go to, uh, there's going to be levels and stages to this. And he says, when you go to heaven, you cannot leave. It's impossible for you to leave. But he says, those people that go to hellfire, uh, he leaves it open. So what he says, for well, this word forever we, it's translated forever, but it, forever, but it's not really forever. It's indefinite, meaning I don't tell, I'm not going to tell you how long it is. It could be forever. It could not be, right? But for sure, if you make it a paradise, you're in there forever. You can't go back. You can't go somewhere else. So Allah is talking. So the Prophet is talking to these uh, Arabs, convincing them, trying to convince them of this, and uh, the idea is for them to attract their attention. So I'm going to read one more uh, surah. Before we go, um, Surah 90, which one am I going to do here? 93. <clears throat> so this one was before the Surah I just read. <clears throat> Let me see. <clears throat> yeah, so. Uh, 93 is Duha or um, the dawn. <clears throat> you hear that a lot, right? So this is this is before that surah was revealed. 
this is around the time when the prophet received the first couple of revelations. You remember the first revelation, he was afraid. In the second revelation, he was still afraid. It was a revelation when he was covered. And he said, Allah says, take the cover off and get out there and tell these people about this thing, right? So he's like, he's still afraid because this is your natural instinct. If you are if me, if an angel talked to me and told me to recite, I'll be scared, <laughs> right? That's just, that is, really shows the sincerity of him. Instead of him saying, oh yeah, I'm a messenger of Allah, I know, because he told me this, right? It shows the, if you read the Quran and you read how it was revealed, you see his um, confidence building. He realizes, yes, I really am the messenger. And he talks to people in that manner. And even when he talks to people a little bit too confidently, like I'm going to give you the message tomorrow, Allah said, hold up, man, you're going to live a bit too far. I'll tell you when you get this revelation, right? So uh, at this time, he hasn't received any revelation, and he is concerned about it. And this when this Surah 93 comes in, and it says, Aduha walili ida saja mawada aka rabuka fa makola wala ahira tu hairu la kamina ula wala sofa yatika rabuka fa torda alam yajitka yatima fala fa awa wa wajadaka dola fa hadda wa wajadaka a ila fa agana. فَأَلَمْ يَأْتِ مَا فَلَا تَقْهَرْ وَأَمَّا سَائِلَ فَلَا تَنْهَرْ وَأَمَّا بِنِعْمَةِ رَبِّكَ فَحَدِّثْ And it is translated by the night, by the morning's brightness, by the night when it covers the darkness. Your Lord has not taken leave of you, nor, ha nor does he hate you. In other words, your Lord did not leave you astray nor does he hate you. The hereafter is better for you than the first, or better than this life. And your Lord is going to give you, and you will be satisfied. This is all a, a confirmation and a, and a comfort to our prophet. And your Lord is going to give you, and you will be satisfied. Then it says, did he not find you as an orphan and gave you refuge? He found you lost and guided you. He found you poor and made you self-sufficient. So as for the orphan, do not oppress him. And as for the person who asks, do not repel them. Somebody asks something for you, do not repel them. For as the favor of your Lord, repeat, repeat, re proclaim it. So he's again telling them to go out and proclaim this. So when these ayahs are revealed, I... We have to think of them in, in terms of um, contemporary uh, times. How do they apply to us? So first, when Allah says, Aduha, he's talking about the when, as soon as the sun starts piercing through the darkness in the morning time, right, when, before, when we're about to pray Fajr prayer. And it says, Walayli idha saja, and the night when the darkness is coming over it. And it's... Um, Oh, it says Sajjah, right? So the darkness and this bright light is coming through. So, the, the, so Allah is talking to him about the light that is coming out of the darkness, which is literally him and this Quran. Allah says, I did not leave you. I did not forsake you. I think that that's a good word to say because he said, I did not leave you astray. Because what happened, it was months gone, gone by and he hadn't received the revelation. And the Meccans were mocking him. They said, oh, I thought you said you was a prophet. You told me it was a prophet, and there was a lady named Um, <clears throat> um Jamil. Was a was a was a pagan who was mocking him. Like, oh, she said your devils left you, didn't they? She she said it was devils that talked to you. Your shaitans came and talked to you. Food, you thought thought you was a messenger of Allah, right? So they are mocking him, like saying, uh, you told me you was a prophet. You had, where, where's the revelation? And then this comes to comfort him. He says. I did not forsake you. It says leave you, but I want to use the word forsake for a reason. Because if you remember, when I, when I was talking about um, Esau, the Lamb of Jesus, when it says that he was on the cross, he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Um, go sit down, man, stop walking in front. He's just going to walk in front of the camera. Uh, why have you forsaken me? So at that point, at least in the Bible, it suggests that he thought God forsook him. And at this time, our prophet thought so too. He thought that God forsook him. 
Now, the interesting part about this is I was telling you that it's, this is the progression of our messenger of, of the messenger of Allah, is that he was in doubt at first. He is also the same man. He said, so Allah is saying, I did not forsake you. I did not leave you, nor do I hate you. Right? He's trying to say, I love you, because he thought maybe either, either Allah forsaken me or Allah hates me because he's not giving him any more, any more revelation and is basically embarrassing me. Everyone is mocking me now. So this is the same man. He thought he was being mocked at the beginning of his miss, mission. Before he went to Medina, before they made the hijrah, him and Abu Bakr are in the cave and Abu Bakr is scared because the Meccans are coming to kill him. And he says, don't worry, Allah is with us. That's the progression. That's, you see then from somebody who is not sure about themselves to somebody who is, I know Allah is with me. We're going to be fine. Right? right? So, and that, that's, the, that's the progression that happened to him. That's why it is more of a believable story. He's a regular human being and he, his courage is being built up more and more because the things that he's saying is like, this is actually true. These things actually happen to me. Every revelation he receives, he gets more and more confidence. At one point, he is in the middle of a war, fighting, and the Muslims are losing. And the enemies are coming towards him, shooting arrows at him. And he says, I'm not a liar. I'm definitely the prophet and the messenger of Allah, and I'm moving forward. And then all the people, all the Muslims start getting courage and start going forward as well. So this is, goes from, I don't know if God is with me, to I'm sure God is with me. As I'm telling y'all, I'm going forward. I don't care what y'all do by myself. So the, the courage of him, when you lead, read the life of the prophet, you realize his evolution. and how That's why we say Allah is the God and the evolver. We say Rub, right? Rub is translated as Lord in all the Qur'ans. But that does it a complete injustice, a complete disservice. Rub means a sustainer. It means an evolver. It, he brings you from being afraid from being insecure about yourself to being very secure in your belief in Allah. That's why Allah says there is no doubt in this. You have no, your, your iman, your conviction grows stronger the longer you become a Muslim. And here, as you can see, he is growing as well. So from there it says, um, have that forsake you or know if I hate you. And it says, and the hereafter is better than this life. Now this is for the prophet. It's for the people he's listening to and for the prophet as well saying that the reward that you get now is going to be good, but the hereafter is going to be better. And he's talking to Meccans who are not necessarily believing in the hereafter. This is why his mission, initially, his, his dawah is belief in God, excuse me, and the hereafter. Aisha, radiallahu anha, says he didn't teach people initially, don't drink, don't gamble, don't steal, don't rob. He taught, he said, because she said, if he taught them that, they would repel it. So his first mission was, Allah is one, and there is going to be a hereafter. So everything you do in this life, you're going to be held accountable for. Those two things you can't get away from. You can act like you're upset about them, or you don't want to, you want to ignore them, but ultimately you're going to have to come to terms with them, right? So that's the, that's the beginning of his message. That's why he's talking about hereafter all the time in these short stories. And it says, your Lord is going to give you and you will be satisfied. Now, when I think of this, I think of our people, African-Americans. I, I, I told you I try to think of these things in contemporary times, right? That Allah is saying the hereafter is better. <clears throat> that Allah is going to give us and we'll be satisfied. And then this part really gets me. He says, did he not find you an orphan and give you refuge? Now, our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi was an actual orphan. His father died before he was born, and then his mother died when he was a little child, and he was taken in the care of by a, a, an African woman. But ultimately, he is considered an orphan because his mother and father returned to Allah. So, he's, so Allah is bringing him to mind. You were, your parents were gone, I still took care of you, so you'll be fine. When we think of the African American and the experience that we had in the Americas, right? Our, we, were orphan, we are orphan people. The reason I want to go to Mali, the reason I want to go to Africa, is so I can reconnect with my ancestors. So I won't be an orphan. Uh, when, we were in, when we were in Mecca, you and I, and I was with the brother that was from Atlanta, they asked us where we're from. And it took us a while to realize what, we were, what they were saying. And we said we're from West Africa, but we don't know where because we were kidnapped. The people don't know our actual history. It was little kids asking us, us this. They didn't have any motive. They just want to know where you're from because everybody's from different places. So we are, in, a, in that sense, we are orphaned. Come here, man. In that sense, we are orphaned. 
and Allah still gave us refuge, right? He still made us, uh, gave us refuge, and it says, and he, and he found you. You were lost, and he guided you. Every African American that accepts this thing, or is accepting this guidance from Allah when they were lost. Each of us, even myself, I'm saying as somebody who was born a Muslim, right? It was at some point in my life that I got consciousness to be a conscious Muslim. I was born Muslim. I was praying with my father, doing all these things, and then at some point in my teenage life, I said, you know what? This stuff is really true, right? So at that point, I was a conscious Muslim. At that point, I was guided by Allah. I was lost, and, and Allah guided me. And we can say the same thing for all of humanity, but I just want to put it in the perspective of the people in our community. He said he found you poor and he gave you and made you self-sustaining. Now, our prophet, especially at this time, wasn't wealthy. Well, him and um, Khadijah were well-to-do, to be honest with you. She owned a business and he was working for her. So there was well-to-do. But as soon as he said, I'm a prophet, I'm a messenger, they boycotted him. What they called it was the, um, <clears throat> the year of sorrow. The year of sorrow, what happened is, so as soon as he started saying that I'm, a mess, I'm the messenger of Allah and there's only one God, all the Meccans started divorcing anybody that was a Muslim. They said, uh, your, divorce, your marriage is over now because he believes in one God and we believe in multiple gods. So they severed all the marriage ties, right? And said, now you go, you go here, you come back with us to our tribe and you go over here with Muhammad and believe in that stuff y'all believe in, <laughs> right? That's, that's what they did, right? So not only did they do that, they did that on purpose so they can say, now nobody can trade with them, right? So they, in effect, made them poor. They said, nobody can trade with y'all. Nobody does any business with them ever. Since they're going to be Muslim, let, let Allah take care of them, right? And then they, uh, he lost his protection. His uncle, um, Ab Abu Talib, died. And that was his main protector that was keeping people from killing him. So he goes to Taif and try to get protection. They laugh at him, basically, throw rocks and stones at him, uh, embarrass him. Um, so at this time, and this is the same year, the year of sorrows, when Khadijah died. So all of these things happen to him. So in that sense that he's, he's poor, but Allah is still going to give him the ability to persevere, to make it through. And the same thing is true with us. All the ordeals, all the things that we face, we have to realize that each of them are a test from Allah. And we can see how those things benefit us as a collective, as a community, and as an individual. So he said, Allah found you poor and gave you sustenance. So as for the orphans, do not oppress them. And this is what I think about with that. If we are seen as orphans, right, and we feel as, as orphans because we don't have a real homeland, we don't know exactly where we are from, then we should be the last people to oppress anybody else who was ever in the same situation. Now, when you think of that, that makes perfect sense, but you realize throughout history and right now, this is happening. Uh, when you think about Israel and the persecution that the Jewish people have faced throughout history, and then they are persecuting another people. Right? So Allah is saying don't oppress the orphans when you yourself was one. So we can't get to a position where we feel, oh, I'm, I'm um, self-sustaining now. Allah has helped me. Allah, Allah has benefited me. So now I can oppress someone else. I'm going to tell you one situation when I realized that was happening. <clears throat> it was maybe 15 years ago. Whenever um, George Bush, uh, the second George Bush was president, he gave a speech and he was mentioning um, uh, Mexicans and uh, deporting them and uh, at that time you know it was an issue of they're taking all our jobs and all these things and I was around I was working with them I have African American friends who look down on Mexicans and it hit me like a ton of bricks one day I'm like why are you looking down on Mexicans but what, what gives you the right to do that like you are oppressed people in this land you think since they've been oppressed right now, you can look down on them. It, it was like, oh, yeah, they just sell oranges. They just sell apples. <laughs> What's wrong with that? Right? What is there a problem with that? Is there a problem with getting, making an honest living? Oh, they're all in the same house together. Oh, they're all in the same car together. That is family. Right? The reason that they are being successful is because they stick together, because of that family bond that they have, because they'll work hard for a living. Right? I'll tell you right now, I have a contract. I had a contract in my house, a bunch of them that were the same persuasion as me never showed up. But the Mexican guy showed up, fixed it, did everything he was supposed to do, right? So maybe it's something we should learn from them. But we were, 
as collectively. A lot of us just thinking bad or talking negatively about somebody when we are in that we in the same position. We just just a little bit, you know, on the stat on the stratosphere. We just a little bit higher. Oh, we so look at them, look at them over there. They, they deporting them. You know, why are you looking down on anybody else? Right. So when Allah says that's for the orphans, don't oppress them, because He's talking about you were an orphan. And then it says for those people who ask of you, do not repel them, do not turn them away. Now, that's a hard task, you know, because we are a people don't, that don't have a lot ourselves. So when you see somebody on the street and they're asking for, and they got a sign saying, "I need a dollar" or something like that, you're like, man. I, I work hard for this dollar. I don't know if I want to give it to somebody else, right? But Allah says, don't repel him, right? And, I, and the brother, uh, I, I hope the brother's listening. Montez told me the same thing. <laughs> there, there's a thing on, uh, on Facebook. It says, uh, when, you, when you're on time with a drive, a Walmart, and, you, and somebody beside you with a sign you're looking for, like, I don't, like I don't see him, right? <laughs> right? He's like, man, go give that man a dollar, man. <laughs> right? Right? Because Allah says, Allah says you do not decrease with any of your charity, any of the charity you give, right? And uh, inshallah, I'm going to give a khutbah on that on uh, Sadaqa on Friday so we can get kind of get a, a better understanding of that and how we should view those people, anybody that asks us for money. Because the first thing we're thinking is, what is he going to do with this money? What is he going to do with this money, right? So there's a there's an explicit hadith about this and a, and a story with the prophet and the sahaba around him of people and what they thought was going to happen because of, I mean, with the sadaqah that they gave. So Allah says, don't repel them, right? So it's something that you can give them. I'm going to add this because I think it's, it's important. I was talking about my father earlier and him uh, taking some library books. And I'm going to say this about him. That man never ever repelled somebody. He, I don't even know if he, if maybe he took this verse to heart. He had to take this verse to heart because he lived this. Everywhere we went, he's, he worked for the city of Norfolk his whole life, so he knew everybody in Norfolk, everywhere we went. And someone asked him, you know, ask him for money, randomly, right? If he did not have the money, he would ask me, you got a dollar to give him, I'll give it to you later. Right? <laughs> I swear, every time, every time. He would always, if he didn't have the money in his pocket, he would ask somebody else for it, he said, I'll pay you back, right? So th this is, this is the, the, set, the mindset of how a Muslim should be if it's something that we can give. And then if it's something that we don't have, we can't give it. Allah says, I mean, the prophet says a smile. Anything that you do good is a subdica, is a charity. So if you can't give him any money, give him some of your time. Give him a book. That's the other thing that I forgot to mention is that um, the, in Mali, you know, we talk about the gold and all the things that they gave, that, all the gold that Mansa Musa gave away. But Zakia said their main import was books, was knowledge. That was the most important thing to them, not, not gold, right? And they have all this gold they can give away, but what they gave away the most was books. What people wanted the most from them was books. That was when knowledge was important to us. That's why a university was built there, right? It was so important. Now, we, it's, it's, it's far and wide that people care about learning and gaining knowledge. Look how many people are here now, right? Instead of doing whatever they're doing, right? Or gaining knowledge, if they're gaining any knowledge at all, It'll be a knowledge about a football game or a basketball game. By the way, you know, in the United States just lost to Lithuania in basketball. You know, all the effort and time they put into that. I know people who spend their life learning basketball, teaching their kids basketball. Then somebody else in Lithuania, you know, beat them, you know. <laughs> and listen, I, I don't vote against America, but I don't, I'm not really sad if they lose. Like, I, <laughs> this is the reason why. It's because when I see somebody in Greece, is a, the, what's the guy's name? Greek Freak. He's he's technically from Nigeria, but he's playing for Greece. Mm -hmm. uh, Joe and B is from Nigeria also, but he's playing for France. If they win, I mean, you see this guy, this black guy here. You know he's not um, from really his family, not from France. He should be from Nigeria, playing for Nigeria. Then we'll really know whether France has a really good team or not. So the team in America is mostly African Americans, but we came here <laughs> stolen, <laughs> right? So we should be the last people on the team representing USA, you know, to be honest with you. So I'm not really sad, you know, I'm, I'm, so, but that's another, that's another point. Um, so Allah says, he showed favor and go out and talk to people. That was the last part of this surah. So again, Allah is telling him, telling our prophet and telling us, go out and tell people about this thing. Uh, explain to them the significance of it.
and we can do just like our prophet did. We don't have to give them long speeches or long explanations. Just explain to them that there is one God, and there is going to be a day of accountability. Um, when I was talking about us on a desert island, those people that knew about that knew that we had a soul and knew that there was a God, they knew that there was going to be a hereafter. There was going to be an accountability for this thing. When they put their heads together, they realized that we weren't here for no reason. We weren't here for sport, right? So whatever that reason is, we're going to be held accountable for what we did. So they knew that man has known that since the beginning of time. And the, re the real reason they knew it is because Adam Alayhi Salaam was a prophet. But most people don't know this. It's the Muslim who knows this, who knows that the first human being with knowledge and intelligence that was able to speak, don't put your hand over there, um, got the revelation from God on how to live and how to be a good and righteous man. Right, that's where they get this. That's where he gets. That's where the man gets his uprightness from. Allah didn't leave you out without any explanation, without an example of how to live. There's someone I know right now. Hopefully, he's listening, or maybe he's listening. I'm gonna put it on my page so he'll listen. His name is Ishmael, too. Right, his name is Ishmael, and he says that he believes in God, but he believes that you find it basically the the the, the way to God cosmically, like you just think about it and then you come to the truth. Right now, I'm saying you can do that. Right, I do. I do believe that is true, but that would mean though that God, the Creator of this universe, didn't give you the the directions on how to get to Him. Everybody got their own individual way. Right, it's eight billion people on Earth, and we all got different ideas and different thoughts. To, and the way to make us one Ummah, to make us united, is if we have a guidance. And this is how you do it. This is how you behave. And when you do this, you'll get the best out of life. You'll be the best person you can be. And Allah repeatedly sent messengers and prophets to show us how we are supposed to be. The alternative to that is that we all be supposed to be different. And we're supposed to find God on our own. Right? That, that would say he really didn't care about us. Right? He didn't care enough to tell us or show us the right way. Uh, so I'm, I'm trying to convey this to him. Hopefully he'll understand. I've invited him to the mash yet as well, so we can talk about these issues uh, more. Because when you juxtapose El Islam and any other way of life, any other thinking, you see how superior El Islam is. Hello, go sit down in the chair. Right now. Um, sit down in the chair. Uh, you see how superior El Islam is, because his way of thinking is everybody get their own way. All eight billion people of us. I am saying Allah sent a revelation to the messenger to the messenger of Allah, and He gave, gives us direction. And this is what I want to uh, impress upon people: when you see the Muslim and all one billion of us praying in one direction, nothing else can do that but deen, but religion. But a guidance from God that can make all people do the same thing, right? That's unity. That's what people all around the world are trying to get and trying to gain some uh, common understanding, some common belief, so we can have common practices. The only thing that can do that is El Islam, right? If you so if you if you just if you put beside what he thinks and what we think, one of them is already easily shown to be more superior. It makes more sense. That Allah sent a revelation and explained it to us, and this is an example, or we all get to pick whatever we want to do. And when you do that, when you make things arbitrary, and this is what happens in Christianity, He's, his background was Christianity. They are far less likely to rise to the occasion of a Muslim. We pray five times a day. It's an obligation. We pray more than anybody in history. Nobody else prays more than us as a whole because they don't have any time. They don't, they don't have Jewish people have three times a day. They're probably the closest, right? Even though it's only 14 million of them. So again, we are one, we are two billion. We pray more than anybody on earth, right? Because it's prescribed five. So even if we miss three, we still pray more than everybody on earth, <laughs> right? You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. They, they pray on Sunday and then when they feel like it, if they want to get some money that day or if they want to praise God that day, we don't pray when we feel like it, right? We have a certain amount of that we, uh, zakat that we have to give. When you, this, and this really rings true in uh, philanthropy. We talk about billionaires, right? We got so many billionaires in America. 
and we are so thankful that they are giving whatever money, but if they're doing it arbitrarily, based on their own whims, they'll give a certain amount of money that they feel comfortable giving, and they'll give it to this one group of people that they like. Right? That's the problem with giving all these resources to one person. One man walking around here with a million with a billion dollars, right? Who has no religious affiliation, well, I'm gonna give it to this pe these people because I think they deserve it more. When some if if we have an institution where you spread it around to everybody, more people will benefit from it than just who you like. Because if you are, if, if it's me, if I got a billion dollars, I'm gonna give it to my family and my friends and this mass shit, right? But maybe a mass shit in, in California that really needs it. So that's why the institution is important. That's why it's important to have something to spread everybody around to everyone, not just what I feel. Because I may, I may be sincere. I'm gonna give it. I know my, I know this community needs. It. I'm gonna build a huge mash. Like, like, like Saudi right now. They're building all these things over here. When people are all in Yemen right now in a war, they're fighting, they're shooting, they're killing people, they're killing people in uh, Sudan. And all these different places need it. But you're building huge buildings. And that's what happens when you don't. Follow the tenets of Palestine, but when you do, you are more practicing, you're more righteous than everyone else. When you have a set month that you fast, because you know people in other other faiths they fast, right? They say well they like fasting, they do it arbitrarily. No other group fasts more than us. No other group. When the prophet says pray on uh, fast on these certain days and pray and fast, that's recommended and a mandatory fast during the month of Ramadan. We fast more than everybody else. We sacrifice more than everybody else. We think about God more than everybody else on this earth. As a whole, as a people as a whole. So that's what happens when you have a structure instead of doing things arbitrarily. This one brother Ishmael, he may, maybe he does more, maybe prays more than everybody else. But it's only him that's doing it. Right? Maybe he fasts more than everybody else, but it's only him that's doing it. Because his religion is Ishmaelism. You know, him and his family are the only people that do it. Right? If there's, it has to be something that's, man, man, uh, that's universal and that's for all people. And this is what this dean is. And alhamdulillah, we have uh, heard it, accepted it, and uh, lived by it. Uh, any questions? Uh, well, the last thing you touching on, you know, uh, people that pray, my, and that my mind comes to, to, to you know the Buddha people mm -hmm. in Europe. They, right. they, I mean, I mean, they got a history of, of you know, a lot of praying. So this is the other thing, brother. <laughs> this is the good thing. And that, this, that's a very good point. And this is the good thing with them, is that they yeah, practice a thing. Sacrifice it. Right, right. So this is the thing about that is um, this monasticism. I hope I'm spelling this correctly. Allah pro prohibits. Monasticism in El Islam. Monasticism is this. I'm going to explain to you what it is. So Buddha, according to the legend of Buddha, he was a wealthy man. He was a prince. He had all kinds of money. And uh, he got enlightenment and he wanted to go all around. He wanted to do nothing but pray all the time, right? So he gave away all his money and prayed. He went out into the, into the wilderness and prayed all day and all night. Then he came out and begged for money. Then he went back and prayed. Right? <laughs> right now. That's what happens when you go to one extreme. Right? One extreme is we don't pray at all. We, we, I guess the, the one extreme is we don't pray at all. Then you get closer to we pray whenever we feel like it. Right? We have a set number of prayers or you can dedicate your whole life to praying. Allah is against this. Allah says we don't supposed to do that. Because one reason is how can the other people know about it? We don't supposed to go somewhere and just leave the society. We are an example for the society. They're supposed to, we're supposed to be able to intermingle with them, not leave them and say, that's what Buddha did. He went, he went by himself and said, let me pray over here for the rest of my life. And what happened is, according to the story, is he got nirvana and then he transformed into the Buddha. This, spirit, this uh, great awakening spirit came to him, right? That's according to their legend of what happened. If we did that, we would be in this mass shit all the time and never interact with anybody else. In fact, we'd give everything else away. Everything we get, we would be charitable, but only for that one day. Because I gave everything else away. I don't have anything now. Now I'm basing my life on everybody else giving me money. Now we're all supposed to get our share of this dunya. So we're supposed to get our share of this life and the hereafter. So what, he, what they are doing is going to the furthest extreme. And the reason I still say that we pray more than them is because we have a, we doubled their number. They have about 800 800 million Buddhists, and it's two million, two billion, 800 million Buddhists, 
and it's about two billion Muslims. So overall, we still pray more than them. But if they dedicate, they, and these are only monks that do this, by the way, it's Buddhists all around here. Tina Turner is a Buddhist, right? So she's not necessarily dedicating her whole life to praying, right? <laughs> but that's the image that you get that that's what they do. They, you know, they're wrapped in an orange and they pray all day, all night. But those people who do that, and they're following Buddha, you're supposed to give everything else, everything you got away. Beg, and then just keep praying, and then one day you won't get this enlightenment. They went to this furthest extreme, and I'm going to tell you what happened with that. In my opinion, I'm going to make sure I say this is my opinion, because Buddha came before Jesus, and we see what happened with this, the message of Jesus. It was changed. The same thing is true with Buddha. The first uh, scriptures written about Buddha came two to three hundred years after Buddha lived. I don't think Buddha did what they attributed to him. I think possibly Buddha was a prophet. Right? Buddha also is not, we think of Buddha as Asian. Buddha was Egyptian. Buddha had dread and had breeds. Right? Right? Buddha, the, according to historians, there's some historians that say he was an Egyptian priest. Right? And he was of African descent. He looked like you and I did. Right? So they, they've changed him to look like they do. Right? How, how they do now. Right? And I think also from just from his teachings, and they also did this. This is the other thing. They are praying, but they're not who you know who they're praying to? You can be a Buddhist atheist. You know that you don't have to believe in God. They the, the two things that Buddhas that, put, that that are the most important things to human life, the two questions, Buddhists do not even answer. One of them is who is God and why am I here? They have no answer for that. They really don't have an answer for what's the hereafter, what's after this. Buddhism is based on um, suffering and understanding human suffering and your suffering in this life. And once you understand it and overcome it, you get this thing called nirvana. You get this thing where you get the, the enlightenment. So the human problem, the problem I told you, if we're on a desert island, we're going to be thinking about why we're here. They do not have the answer for it. Right? And I don't think Buddha, somebody who would dedicate their life to this, would not give the answer for it. Nor would he say, nor would he not tell them about God. In their teachings, there is no definitive doctrine about God. So you cannot believe in God at all and still be a Buddhist because they're praying to Buddha. What I'm saying is I, I am fairly certain that they changed his teachings. I believe Buddha was probably a prophet that was sent to a certain group of people. And then they change his, his message the same way Jesus' messages was changed. I don't believe somebody would dedicate their life, their life to, uh, to uh, improving human life would never ask why we're here. Would never say anything, not say anything about God. What he was doing, his whole mission was the antithesis of Hinduism. So he was born in Hinduism. So in Hinduism, they believe in multiple gods. But they also believe in one God. <laughs> they believe in one God named Brahman, who is an, uh, I hope I'm spelling this right, Brahman, who is an um, all-seeing, all-powerful, all-wise God who cannot be seen, who cannot be hurt, cannot be harmed in any way. Brahman is a law, right? So this is what happened. Brahman is too far from them. So they started making individual gods in between them. And you know what they did? They made three gods. They made a trinity long before Christianity trinity. They had, his name was Shiva, Vishnu, and Brahma. Um, Bra something like Brahman too. It's very similar to the, the name of the one true God. So this God was too, it was too far away for them, too abstract. So they made three gods and then Vishnu, I mean, Vishnu, Shiva, and Brahman would... They had Ganesh. Huh? They had Ganesh. Yeah, so Ganesh is in there too, but Ganesh is the... I think he's the monkey guy, right? No, right? he's the guy with all the hands. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, so this, this is the thing with Ganesh. This is with Ganesh. Yeah. Um, let's see if I got this right. Shiva is the god of destruction. It's Vishnu. Vishnu incarnated eight or nine times. That's where... Um, that's the one with all the hands come from. Yeah. So he incarnated into... Uh, um, a tortoise into a um, half man, half lion, into a fish, into Krishna, into Rama, into that God with all these hands. So you see what happens. So first, this is this is this is this is why it's so important to understand Christianity because when you do, you see where it came from. Allah is God, right? So we'll say Elohim is God. 
Then they said, well, God came down as a man, as Jesus. And then the Father said, the Holy Ghost, this has been happening. They just replaced it with these people. And they said God incarnated, and he keeps incarnated. And some of, some of the Hindu scriptures say that, um, or some of the Hindu's belief is that Jesus is one of those incarnations. So this is what happened with that. Is that Hinduism, Hindu, the word Hindu period comes from the word that means uh, from the Indus Valley. So <laughs> in all reality, the, the uh, European man named their religion Hinduism. They didn't, they never called it Hinduism. They just said, everybody over here, y'all Hindus, <laughs> right? Which is so disrespectful, right? They were called, it was called the Greek teachings. And they put it all together and said, this is all Hinduism, because you're from this place. And they also had a caste system, though. The caste system says, because they believe in incarnations. So they believe that um, you keep dying as a cycle. You keep dying over and over again. You keep coming back. So the, be the more righteous you are, the better position you are when you come back. So if you're a righteous person now, you come back in another status, you'll be a wealthier person, you'll be in a higher status. And then they have the caste system. That, and <laughs> interestingly enough, uh, it is based upon your complexion. So the lighter you are, the more righteous you are. The darker you are, the more you are close to wickedness. And if you're a dark-skinned person, that means that your life before this, you was a terrible person. You came back darker and darker. And then, <laughs> listen, then ultimately you can come back and become not only a human being, you can become an insect or an animal, right? Because you, the worse you get, the further down you start going, right? So Buddha was born in this system, this Hindu system. And he said, that's not right. Now, I don't believe in this caste system because he was a prince already. So he was up here with these people, right? He said, but that's, and he had money. So he said, that's not right. So I'm going to, I'm going against all of this. And his movement was a uh, was basically in competition with them, so he was saying that stuff is wrong. So, uh, but he believed, according to him, they still they they, had, they still both had this thing of nirvana where you have this great awakening. But I said all that to say that his Buddha's uh, system was was uh, in contrast to Hinduism. He was saying Hinduism is wrong. He was saying that caste system is wrong. All these things is doing wrong. But he took out, according to what they have of him, all of these gods, though, not just the three. No, he didn't mention, he, not to say that you can't be a Buddhist and believe in God, but he didn't say nothing about it. It's just like this Quran. This, I'm going to tell you another thing. This Quran right here is filled with words about Allah. Right? The reason they say one third of the Quran is. Um, um, Icles is because in that one in that four lines Allah talks about his nature, right? So talking about God is one third of this book. And when you read this book over and over again, Allah is talking about you're going to heaven or you're going to hell uh, if you're not a righteous person. If that is not in this Quran, it's almost 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 all of it is all gone. Is what I mean. That's how important it is. And this man who is supposed to be a reformer. Didn't say anything about God. Didn't say anything about the hereafter. Didn't say anything about your purpose in this life. I don't believe that's the case. I believe that whoever got a hold of his uh, teachings left those things out. It's impossible because every people in, in the history of life has always believed in God and a soul in your hereafter. Those three things are not talked about by Buddha his whole life. Or it's not, what happens is it's not recorded. Because hundreds of years later, somebody wrote about Buddha, and I think, personally, I think they left out the parts where he talked about those things and, and kept this part where you pray forever and then you get this nirvana. But then, again, this is just my opinion on it. I, don't, I can't say for certain there's nothing to say that, but I wouldn't be surprised at all if they found out that Buddha was a prophet. Because he was saying all this stuff is wrong. He was, he was saying this stuff is not true. So he probably said this trinity is not true either. This is this one God is really true, and they took all of it up. Because Hindus outnumber Buddhists, it's more, it's more, it's a, mil, it's a over a billion uh, Hindus, and it's, they've been in a billion for forever because they just, you know, they're, they're the people in the Hindus, in this Hindus Valley, in the Indian Indus Valley, and they just outnumber them for forever. Just recently, Buddhists, because Buddhists, Buddhism is a proselytizing religion. Buddhism, Christianity, and Islam. Hinduism is not, because they believe in. 
incarnation. They believe in you're born the way you are because of what you did previously. So they don't really go and tell people you should be a Hindu. They're like Jewish people. They were like, I was born this way. I'm sorry for your luck, right? <laughs> I'm born this way. I don't know what's I don't know what happened to you, what you prayed, what you did in your let your past life, but you didn't come as a boot as a Hindu. Sorry for your luck. So they don't tell you you should be this. You can become a Hindu. You can you can get into Hinduism, but you would never see somebody knocking on the door and say you want to be a Hindu. <laughs> never. Hey, it's nice. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Uh, the one last point I want to make about that is this: both Hinduism and Judaism have something that's a defect in their religion because of it, though. Something that is really it's um. What's the word? It's not compassionate. They lack certain compassion because they believe you're born the way you were born on purpose. God made you that way. In the Bible, there say, it says that you can't, if you're lame, you can't come into the synagogue. Because they believe God made you that way on purpose because you probably did something wrong. The same thing is true with Hindus people. If you are a cripple or something, they look at you as lower class. Because you must have, your previous life, you must have been terrible because God made you now with no legs. Right? <laughs> right? Really. And then this is the other thing that happens because of that, though, is that when you start believing in incarnation over and over again, you never get the complete urge to change your ways because you know you always got another chance. <laughs> yeah, 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 I did bad this life. Yeah, I want to rob and steal. Yeah, yeah, but next year, next time, I may come back as a dark skinned person. Then I just do better next time. Right? That's, if you believe that you're going, if you believe it's just an endless cycle, you just do better next time. And if, in Islam, say, this is your one on the chance, buddy. This is the life Allah gave you. You better do something with it right now. And ain't no telling when it's going to end. That brings about a instantaneous willingness to change or desire to change. Because if you got all, if you got a million chances, that's what you're going to take. All them chances. That's the other reason why Allah doesn't tell you when you're going to die. You know, you know. One of the things in the Quran is Allah says, um, um, "Don't ask the prophet about certain questions." It doesn't say what those questions are, but I think one of the questions would be is, "When am I going to die?" He's the prophet, right? He can tell you. He has direct line to Allah. He can tell you when you're going to die. So you know what people would do is, well, I just do everything I want to. I know I'm going to die on the 17th, on the 16th. I say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, right? So, right, that's it, right? But if you don't know when, then you, it's, it's right now is your is your only opportunity. That's why I, I like to mention that in the cookbook. This opportunity, this breath you have, you can I can die right here while where I'm standing, right, right now. Right, and this happened before. That. Interestingly enough, I was looking at um, somebody sent me a video of this comedian who was talking about. Um, she was on stage joking, and she said, "I got the vaccine. I got all these vaccines. I'm super healthy." <laughs> fell out and fainted right there, <laughs> like right when she was talking. She says, "I hope that she was and fell, fainted right on the stage." So I mean, really, you don't know when the, when Allah is gonna you're gonna return to Allah. You just have no idea. So you, that's that gives you the urge to do it as soon as possible. Uh, and then, you know, uh, Masa Musa and the little visit he did over here, and, and uh, is that documented like reasons why he came? And, and so this is what he found when he when he came back when he did. Excuse me. So this is so it's two different things. So Mansa Musa, he went to the Hajj. He didn't come to America. Uh, his brother or uncle? I don't know which one is true. I got now. I told you I thought it was his brother, and then Zakia said it was his uncle. So one of his family member, family members, who was he was the Mansa. Mansa means like king or ruler. Um, gave away his throne to, to navigate, and they said uh, initially they sent some ships, and the ships got lost, and then they sent some more ships, right? And it. They say his name is Abu 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 Bakr was his name. Uh, I saw something recently that said his name was may have been Muhammad, but either way, um, this is the the documentation is in uh, the first time I saw it was in a work by um, Ivan Van Sertima. He has a book called They Came Before Columbus, and he was talking about West African pottery and West African writings and West African. Um, uh, vegetation was found in the Americas before Columbus came, and the um, the Olmec 
the Olmec um, statues that you that they, they they uncovered with the Negroid nose and and big lips was um, was evidence that West Africans had already traveled here, and they found the the, the means of which to travel here. Um, there is being more and more documentation about it, but he was the first person that wrote about it. Um, when I went to ICNA conference two years ago, uh, Aisha Prime was talking about um, Mansa Abu Bakr. She said, listen, remember that name. Because the same way I was telling you about Muhammad and the physical features of Muhammad, and more and more people are realizing that he was brown skinned and all the Arabs were brown skinned. The same thing is true with Mansa Musa's uh, predecessor, or uh, yeah, predecessor, the person before him, is that they're finding information about it, more and more information about it. Probably some of these manuscripts that I'm going to see may say he, this is the person who went, and this is the people that was on the on the ships with him. But they did find in South in South Africa, I mean South America, and in uh, North America, um, things from Western Africa. <laughs> and and, man, and uh, Ivan Sertima wrote this wrote this stuff in his book. Uh, years ago, he's returned to a lot. I can't remember how long ago, but um, those things, he's um, said, uh, is proof that Western Africans had been here before then, and he was the only voyage that they know of that Mansa that came before Mansa Musa. Uh, so they're saying before Columbus, he was here. So now, this is the <laughs> the problem with all of this stuff really is racism, because. So they like kept stuff hidden. Right, but this is the thing: is that now that it is known, there should be more uh, research done. More money should be put into finding out about this. But they see Western African scholarship and Western African voyages, everything, as a little bit down on their list of priorities. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. The same thing is true with Western Af with us. They don't know how many Muslims was on those ships. The reason is because of their lack of research. That book that I have, The Servant of Allah, the lady that wrote it, she said the scholarship on this is very limited. Her book, and I just I got another book from called Muslims in the Chesapeake, it's the only books that I know of, of uh, academics studying these subjects. So they don't really know the answers. They just know a certain amount of Muslims came. I don't know, I don't know what the number is. Right? And the same thing is true of Western African scholarship. If me Ismail Salim can go to Mali and find all these manuscripts. Why didn't everybody else do it, right? Because it's not a priority to them. It's a priority to me. That's why I'm going there, right? They don't care enough. And the same thing is true, unfortunately, with Muslims. The Muslims around the world, if they had a thousand-year-old manuscripts that was in Arabia, buried somewhere, they'd be over there right now studying all of them. But because they're in Western Africa, their scholarship is, I don't know if their scholarship, I don't, you know, even though it's one of the long, oldest universities in history. The other, the other one is uh, another Islamic university because Muslims, we thrive on knowledge. But then that knowledge is different because they're lighter skinned people up there. These Western Africans here, I don't really know what they're talking about. Or maybe they don't know what they're talking about. And which, this, this is what's so bad about it is African Americans feel this way. You know, when I tell them I'm Muslim, they're like, oh, you ain't a real Muslim. You know, you don't, but I'm not listening to you. The guy over here, this, this Arab, he knows Islam. You don't know what you're talking about. They quickly say that. You know, we, we do it to ourselves. These 700,000 manuscripts that is all over this place, should ne they shouldn't be there without being digitized already. I shouldn't be one of the first people to go see it. That's, that's this, ridiculous. Yeah, this time of day. Right, yeah, this, in this time in, in history. If I go there, I should be bumping into everybody and in trying to learn this history and give it to and have it all over the world. This is literally our history, written down. Our actual, actual, actual history written by our actual ancestors. We don't care about it. So what we have to do is we have to show a care and concern for it and hold it to the level of, intelli of, of, of importance that it should be. Because those Muslims that came here, some of them were scholars. They recited the Quran from memory. They were hafiz of Quran. And they would write in Arabic so the slave master wouldn't know what they were writing. They would they were doing all kinds of things. They were praying five times, they were trying to pray five times a day. They were fasting as enslaved people. They even said they had another thing where they would give candy, all the candy that they would give, give it to the kids for Eid, because that's all they had. They even had another thing in this book called Servant of Allah. 
they made something that was symbolic of the Kaaba. And they circumambulated that because they was like, well, we're probably going to never make it to Mecca, so we'll do something here. That's how important Islam was to them. Right? But, but it's not that important to us. If we want to go over and ask a brother from Morocco or from Egypt or from somewhere else about scholarship that we already have. Right? Them, them Arabs that met in Western Africa and they accepted Al-Islam, they learn all the... That's, that's what we have to realize is that we have all the knowledge at our disposal. We don't need somebody else. If you know how to read Arabic and you know and you have all the books, we need somebody to tell you what the books say for. You can read them yourself and teach everyone else. But they have a... We have a inferiority complex. We believe that you can't, you, you can't be teaching the, the real thing or all of it because you you right here with me, which is the exact same thing the Meccan said about Muhammad. It was like, hold on, he grew up with us, <laughs> right? He, he, what you mean he a prophet of God? How you know all this stuff? You, I've been knowing him. I've been knowing him for forty years. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like so, that's it, because you have a familiar a familiarity with somebody, you assume that they they can't be somebody. Yeah. I need a, I need an angel come down from here and tell me this stuff, yeah. and they wouldn't believe it then. Yeah. That's what Allah said. Even if an angel came down here and gave it to you, you still won't gonna believe it. So I'm, I got somebody that they grew up that you grew up with. You know him as truth. I said, "I'm looking, brother." Oh, she's still here. Okay, some of them. Even there's somebody that you know. Okay, you know is a truthful person. You know is not lying. Never lied before ever, right? But you now, you now today, you start lying, right? And so what? What Allah does is say, "Okay, you think you're lying? Ask me something. <laughs> Ask him something. I'm gonna show you that he's not lying." And that's why the, that's why the prophet started building his confidence. At first, he was scared, and they asked him questions. He like, I got all the answers to these questions. You know, I got answers to questions that I, I should not know the answer to. Right? I can tell you about the ocean. I was telling you about the man talking about the waves in the ocean. I can tell you about the universe, how the universe started. I can tell you about an embryo. I can tell you about Egypt when they didn't get the uh, the uh, hieroglyphics until a hundred years ago. I can tell you that what they called the pharaoh and what they called the king. I can tell you that Haman was with Moses. That um, that move that I wrote there about that move. Moses talked about that move. He didn't talk about him in the Bible. Where you get it from? How does he know that Moses knew about the people of that move and he knew about Sully? How do you know this? How do I know all this stuff? How do I know Jesus won't crucify? How do I know Jesus won't God? <laughs> you know how I know all of this? Because he is saying to them, I'm telling you, I'm a messenger. Ask me something. That's how all this stuff came into being. Ask me something. I'll tell you. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you. I this I got I got it from the source that knows everything. Ask me anything. Right? Alright, brother. Someone recorded all the way. Two hours. <laughs> it really has to do with it you gotta do with that speaker. And my phone.